Suns fans, you know what time it is in the PHX. Empire of the Suns. Suns. Phoenix Suns. Empire of the Suns. Hello there, and welcome to the Empire of the Suns podcast. My name is Kellen Olson, joined as always by Kevin Zimmerman. What's up, man? It's been a while, but we're almost at the end of the off season. It's crazy. Been a minute, yeah. I know that we promised at some point we were going to review the Western Conference and kind of look through it, but I do think we're going to have enough time during the preseason and during not this episode, but a couple future episodes to kind of rehash because, again, We were just kind of waiting and seeing. It just felt like there were more trades to get done. We still don't know if the Pelicans have like a center on their roster besides a rookie. Um, There's a lot of players out there that seemingly should be traded that haven't been traded yet. I don't think that's going to happen necessarily, but we were kind of waiting on it. There was other stuff uh, developing we'll talk about later on in the program. But we should start, of course, with Al McCoy. We wanted to podcast today on Friday before media day on Monday to have an episode mainly centered around Al. Uh, Al passed away. And... I've been thinking a lot about what I was going to say on the podcast because I just tweeted like I can't like it, it's in a tweet I can't like sum this up at all and I'm still I've still been thinking like I'm thinking right now still about what I'm <laughs> going to say because it's it's really difficult for me you and I are you were you were still born here right I know you were raised here born here yeah so yeah. we're both born and raised diehard basketball fans in Arizona so for both of us to try and explain what Al McCoy means to not only us, but just as people listening who are not from here or didn't grow up on basketball here, or they grew up on basketball elsewhere. And like, you know, of Al McCoy, but you haven't heard a ton of Al McCoy games like we have over our lives. It's, it's just difficult for us to kind of explain how much he meant to basketball, which here, which hopefully paints the picture well enough already. And we'll like, we'll share some memories here and stuff, but uh, yeah, we 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 had the rumblings that it it was a couple weeks ago that something was coming, and it was um, in those situations like you do kind of you are able to brace for it, but then it's still like yeah, still what it is. Um, what do you just what were your kind of thoughts spiraling through your head in like the last week on remembering Al? Yeah, um, I think you you we can speak on your personal engagements with him, but I just think. One is a professional, like, like in college on. So like I'm, however old I am, 15 years in the business, whatever. Like you get used to stars and and people. Like you're in the locker room with LeBron James. You ask questions to Kevin Durant. You um, cover Steve Nash. All these things. You meet people out. Like, but I've never really been in the presence of someone where I'm like, oh my God, like that's like him walking around son's like the media room that's named after him. And it's just this kind, small old man. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's, it's just, just like, like, oh my, I have to like. Compared to six foot eight, 250 pound LeBron James. Yeah. But it's like, that's the guy where we were like. And it, it just impacts me that way where it's like, you're nervous to talk to someone, which I don't <laughs> yes. like, I'm past that in my career for yeah. most people. Um, so that was super unique and, and just, I think when you speak about like generations and being like the voice of the Phoenix Suns, like I would recommend people go listen to our radio station, go look on YouTube of like Dave Burns, Vince Murata, who grew up here, both of them, and then end up working with Al in some capacity or around Al McCoy. Um, but then up to our generation and like, I don't know if I have to tell younger people this, but UPN 45 games. Yeah. Like, Al McCoy was the voice of the TV, too. When the Suns games were starting to be more and more on TV, they would just simulcast the radio broadcast, I believe. Um, Local was crisscross applesauce right in front of one of those, like, 300-pound <laughs> yeah. televisions. Yeah, he was there. Yeah, Listen so, I mean, he was there when you're a 7-year-old kid. You go to the game, you get in the car after the game, win or lose, and he's kind of recapping everything, and you're listening to him on the drive home. So... Yeah, I mean, that's how monumental it was to me. You can say 50-plus years, but, again, you mentioning Dave Burns and Vince Murata, who are a generation uh, behind us, ahead of us, however you want to phrase it, but then there's another generation beyond that Mm -hmm. that, I don't know, grew up on Al. I mean, if you think of people that are in their 70s, they were in college when Al started calling games, you know? 
Um, but then there's even Suns fans who are like 15 years younger than us who still grew up listening to Al mm -hmm. on the radio, which is wild. Um, I the starstruck thing was always the thing with me. I I'll never forget. I you know this being around me for so long, working with me for so long. I have a horrible memory. Uh, I either remember things that happened forever ago randomly and it's sometimes it's the most random things where i mostly just forget everything like i don't even know what i had for lunch yesterday like yeah, that kind of, uh, i'm that kind of goldfish memory but i have like certain things that always um stick with me and one of them was when i was here on the web desk seven years ago uh seven or eight years ago i want to say and bloom was doing the halftime updates at that point um al and tim or whoever Al was calling games with at the time at halftime would go you know go to the bathroom grab a snack or whatever the things you need to do in the middle of a game when it's on break Al or uh, john would take them through the halftime updates he was out so they needed someone to do it so i did it and i was sitting in like the studio incredibly nervous obviously because i didn't have much on-air experience at all at yeah. that point and it was just going to be me and that was it and like two minutes to go i hear just in the background and coming up on with halftime updates, Kellen Olsen from the studio, and I was like, uh, <laughs> he said my name. "That's my name," and he—that's Al McCoy's voice saying my name. And then I was like, "Save that," and I have it saved somewhere on a computer somewhere. <laughs> I do. I have it saved. I don't know where it is anymore, but I have it saved. And you know me—I I am someone who is socially awkward by nature, mm -hmm. 100 <laughs> percent. <laughs> but once I am around people enough, I tend to open up. So I'm very, very bad at not so much first impressions, but just doing the, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Kellen. Great. I've gotten better at it over my life, but I'm still not great at it. Of course, I'm never going to introduce myself to Al McCoy. Are you insane? No. <laughs> that sounds horrifying. Yeah. I'm not doing that. Yeah. So it was just we were walking by each other one time like three or four years ago and he was just like hey kellen good to see you and i was like oh uh, he knows me he knows that i exist it was it was crazy so i hope that us like geeking out at al mccoy um in those instances can share it i've said this can share the level that he met here um and sharing our own personal experiences i've said this on air a time or two i wanted to be al mccoy when i grew up the first thing that i wanted to do in sports when i was a kid i didn't want to play necessarily i wanted to do play by play um, I like a year, I think last year or two years ago, K Ray was like mapping out his sheet because they have those giant sheets where they list the information. So, in case the 14th man comes in who is some G League call up, mm -hmm. K Ray can tell you exactly who he is because he's a professional and all those guys are incredibly prepared professionals. And I was like geeking out about it and asking him about it. And K Ray, in the, in the same way, was like, No one ever asked me about my sheet. This is kind of cool. Yeah. So, he's like kind of running me through how he does it, where he puts it, and all that kind of stuff. I used to make those when I was a kid. And then when I would play like triple play baseball 99 on my PlayStation or NBA Live, whatever, mm -hmm. I would like call the game <laughs> when I was a kid. So I, I wanted to be and, and if you wanted to be like a play by play guy when you're growing up in Arizona, you wanted to be Al basically. Yeah. Like that's who you wanted to be. So and then like I thought like, oh, I, I don't know if I want to like do this. It's too much talking. I don't really like talking. It, it, ironic. The guy who clappers <laughs> here we are rambles all the time. Um, I was like, oh, maybe like I, it seems like like I'm good in conversation. <laughs> Funny, um, good in conversation. I'll be like a sports psychologist, and I can just like travel with the team. Like, how can I like stay involved in sports? And then I like wrote, and I was like, oh, writing's cool. I like yeah. writing. And then here we are. Um, so, yeah, I didn't really have a ton of personal interactions with Al because again, just like scared out of my mind to talk to him, and always was. Like, it didn't matter that he like seemed comfortable yeah. around me for the most part. I was just still too terrified to ever speak to him and in the same way yeah like it's the best way that i can explain it and i hope that we sound as humble as we possibly can when we say things like this when you're saying the thing about lebron and stuff the way that i can explain it is there are people that are larger than life and believe me like when you see lebron for the first time it's like oh my god there's mm -hmm. lebron james but it's more like you're seeing someone not through a tv or a screen anymore and they're just in front of you like that's the best way yeah. to describe it and but that will go away and like Al and some other people, like it just like never goes away. But he's like the one person I con consistently saw around the arena where it kind of went away mm -hmm. or never went away, I should yeah, say. Yeah. Um, so his I stumbled on the didn't stumble on the air, but I was like the passing of the and I wanted to say legend in front of Al. But I feel like legend is too light for Al. And he was something way beyond that. 
it really is on like that Vince Scully tier of everyone kind of grew up listening to him. And man, it's, it's kind of crazy working for the radio station and just hearing people just say like, yeah, like I still like I'm, I prefer to watch the games, but I actually don't watch the game still because I just want to listen with Al. You should, yeah, our our comment sections on the stuff we've posted, remembering him, it's all that same thing. Like, I turned off the sound. Like, sorry, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> like, but like, not, like, I'm sure Gary would be like, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to also, like, kind of, again, point you toward... We had Mike Breen on um, the radio station. We've had KRA, yeah, he Tim was awesome. Kempton. Shout out to Burns and Gamble for getting that done. He was, um, he was great. But every story about Al is like from play by play guys, like guys in his profession are like, I didn't go approach Al. Al came to me and welcomed me and said, I'll, I'm here for you to have anything you need. And like from, you know, Breen telling like Bob Costas told him, or uh, that might have been. Who was that? That might have been Pash, actually. Pash said, Bob Costas told him, you need to meet Al. Yeah. Um, Breen said, like, he's the dean of all NBA broadcasters. Like, that's the voice of the NBA saying that about Al McCoy. Arguably, um, like, the greatest voice the NBA has Can you had. tell your story that you tweeted about, about the the sitting? Can, and I, can I curse on the podcast? You can bleep yourself kindly, or oh, you'll man, give extra so work excited. to our, our I nice... I got so excited. Yeah. I curse every now and then on the Twitter. You, you curse ever in life? Me. I didn't know. I didn't know. That's so crazy. Uh, again, a miracle I haven't cursed on the air yet. <laughs> we're going yet. strong. Like we're, at some point with this new show, it's going to happen. Um, sure. So, four, five years ago, somewhere in there, before the renovations and stuff, that's the best way my brain remembers it. So, like, we're talking 2018, 2019, maybe. Um, Al would usually um, sit and like hold court is what they refer it to like when someone is having conversations but you can tell like they're the person that is um, not the center of attention but everyone is there to hear what they're saying basically and Al would always sit in like the same spot in the media room and it wasn't like um, it, it was funny because it was actually like my seat where like my name was or whatever on on the thing. But it was like he could. I was never even there because I always sit on the court. I want to watch the guys warm up. I want to like. I would watch Marcus Gasol take like twelve foot floaters and I'd be like, oh, look at that. That's cool. Look at that. That's, That's what just I how do. I am for fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, those are my hobbies. <laughs> touch shots by foreign big men. Um, so I I went in there one time. And Al was in my seat and it was um, this awkward, like, we're looking at each other and I wasn't even there to sit. I was just in there to grab something real quick. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry, Cal. And I was like, Al, the room is named after you. <laughs> Every seat is yours. Please stay seated. And I think everyone laughed. He laughed and he got up and I was like, Al, please sit down. Like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> what are you I'm, doing? I'm being serious. Like, do not get up. Yeah. Please stay seated. Um, and then he's like, oh, okay. I was like, I'm just grabbing something. I, I promise. Like, I'm not, I wasn't coming in here to sit. I'm never in here. You're good. Um, so that that's one of my, uh, probably like the only Al story that I have outside of just, you know, seeing him around. Cause again, just like too nervous to talk to him. <laughs> I'm incredibly proud of myself for handling that interaction as well as I did. Cause you know, I thought it was a good little anecdote of just like he never and everyone else again has talked about this this week Breen like, did too Breen was really heavy with like and Breen I'm sure has been to places where he's talking to the voice of the the Rangers or whatever for nine years and that guy like acts high and mighty or whatever yeah. um no shots at that guy I'm sure he's a <laughs> lovely human being um but all the I'm sure fans. he's seen every um, version of these people and how sometimes they can get like a little bit of an ego and sometimes they can have a whole lot of an ego. And mm -hmm. for him at that time, when Breen was like a little baby, like just calling radio games for the Knicks to have Al at the time, who was already cemented himself as like one of the biggest voices in the league to come over and be kind to him. And then I'll continue to be kind to him. Like, it's just it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy that that is not a that is not a common thing. You and I have not been in this industry nearly as long as those two guys, but we've been around long enough and been around NBA buildings long enough to kind of know how the attitudes can be around there. This sounds like some deep thing, it's like <laughs> no. a horrible place to be. It's generally nice, but it's, it's nice. just like some people kind of have in it like a little bit, you know, puffing their chest out a little bit. Yeah. But I'll, I'll never in a million years have that again. Like would always say hi when I walked by him. I started to say, hi, Al. That's as far as I got. <laughs> How are you doing, Al? But I never stopped to conversate ever. Too scared. Too scared. We're going to miss him, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, I am i can't say enough about just 
the stories, how similar they are that we've heard this yeah. week. Um, not a bad word and only good things from a professional to personal level. Um, yeah, we're going to miss him. All right. There's basketball. There is basketball happening. Yeah. So Mike Budenholzer had a one on one with uh, Steve Ashburner of NBA.com. And it just sort of lays the the map for where we're going to be at and what we're going to be talking about going into the season. I think we have a handful of people listening who haven't listened to us before. If you are here, hello, welcome, subscribe, five hi, stars, hi, hi. all that stuff. Like, say the voice, the voice man stuff. Uh, sea geek? Is that what I'm supposed to say? I don't, I don't know. No idea what you're talking I, about. I you're trying to do like podcast man stuff, like all the podcast man and woman. There's stuff a pop that they up do. up here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> click the click, click the smash subscribe, that smash that. <laughs> I uh, sorry, I got really confused because there's a typo in the story. Bradley Beat is this? I know. Yeah, we oh, we discussed. That's a unfortunate typo. Anyway, so Steve Ashburner had a one on one with Mike Budenholzer on NBA.com. He rolls through a couple of key storylines with Budenholzer, and I think a lot of people, uh, not a lot, but a handful of people listening are here for the first time. If you are. Come on over, stay for a while. We're gonna treat you nice. I didn't like the way that went at all. A lot of people just turned it off and said, "I'm never." I don't back like here that guy. I'm yeah. Go listen to something else instead, and I trust your opinion on that. But I say that as we have a episode titled something about Tyus Jones. I'm sure when the Tyus Jones we do happened, yeah. um, we have the Ryan Dunn Oso oh Igadaro episode. We had like the Nas Little episode, uh, Miami Heat Reclamation Project. Now, yeah, Nas Your Little. All of that is to say, I think a big thing coming into this year was going to be the starting lineup and how I think on, in like a plain, broad view of the team, a conversation normally would be like, who's starting for this team? Who's going for this team? That for me went out the window as soon as Tyus Jones signed with the Suns because his statement said starting point guard. Yeah. And you do not label yourself as starting point guard unless you mean that you are the starting point guard for the team and you want everyone to know that you are the starting point guard for the team. You've been told by someone of, in control of such Mike things. Mike Budenholzer made sure, Ashburner even with the italics put, will will be the starting point guard of this team. And then he named Brad as the starter, which again, I think a lot of people, <laughs> we've had this conversation a million times already, we're going to continue to have it in different ways later on throughout the season. This is their starting five. So... The question becomes, and some of the stuff that I'm going to ask about on Monday is just how you handle the rotations here, specifically with how much, uh, not a lack of size that they have, it is a lack of size, but just how many similarly shaped players, I guess I'll put it as. Like, they just have a lot of 6'5 dudes. Like, they just yeah. have a lot of 6'4 to 6'7 sized guys to get uh, in the rotation. Is there anything specifically you're looking for from Monday? Anything you want to see unearthed? I'm sure the book and KD Paris... Um, taking the progress over will be a storyline, but anything you're looking for? I mean, we've talked about Brad's role, um, and you wrote about this in depth maybe a month ago about, like, is he... Yo, what are you guys doing? Is he going to be... He has to be their top perimeter defender now in the starting lineup? Is that his job now, I guess? He um, is now 3 and D Bradley Beal, yeah. I, I teased that I was going to write about this, and I wrote about this, but the, the pitch basically is you went from asking Bradley Beal to be Bradley Beal to ask Bradley Beal to be starting point guard Bradley Beal to asking Bradley Beal to be 3 and D Bradley Beal because I think he's just 3 and D Bradley Beal on this team unless I'm missing something mm -hmm. and that's not how this team is going to win a championship they're going to win by getting the most out of Bradley Beal they can yeah so I think that's a is, big one is Brad number one for you then just yeah I, I think I personally this is like too nitty gritty maybe for to be publicly like the big storyline but I just don't know how this rotation works beyond the starting five because, like, lots of great shooting. Like, we expect this team's going to take more threes next year. That's going to be a topic that's partially in the um, Ashburner story, partially mentioned, briefly mentioned, whatever. But just the wings that you mentioned in the six four six seven range, like, Royce and Grayson kind of have to play because they're shooters and then it's like I don't know how much the rookies play into this and honestly maybe like that's the big thing like if you had to pick one guy who is going to surprise and be a staple in the rotation is it one of the rookies is it Bobo? I don't know 
and and kind of figuring that out is I'm gonna, interesting I, i'm gonna have my ears my radar okay all tra fully charged fully gonna charged sure radar plug it in before i go to bed have that sucker locked in for Ryan Dunn and Osa Igadaro things. I'm just going to yes, be like, doo, yeah. Doo, doo, doo. What, the sonar, how does it sound? The, you Boop. know the sonar sound? Boop. That was better. I that don't was know. better than my attempt. At it. <laughs> We're both not professionals with the sound editing and sound. You haven't watched enough military history on the History Channel. I need to things. go watch some like submarine Thanks, movie Dad. from the 80s. You know? Yeah, I Hunt for to, Red October. I need to, there uh, you uh, go. See, you, you know pop culture. You know ball. A little. Those are, I'm going to be keeping an eye out for those two with what you're saying. Uh, style of play, again, how many times have we heard an NBA team say, we're going to play fast, we're going to shoot threes, and then what do they do? They don't play we're fast. We're going to play hard on threes. defense. They said all those things last year. This so. is Media Day 101, but in this article as well, he does say, like, Tyus is really good with kickaheads. We're going to look for him to be the guy who gets our pace going. That's going to be interesting there, to hear from Tyus himself. Yeah. There's an interesting part in that Q&A also about, like, do you think Tyus has the ability to say no to Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal and Devin Booker and tell them what to do and order them? And there's a bud quote. I think he says, yeah, it's in his DNA, basically, which, like, better be. You're going to have to. That'll be good. Yeah, and Tyus goes back all the way to, I, if I remember correctly, that Duke team was really good that he mm -hmm. was on. I, I think they came up short in March and didn't really do much in the postseason, but talent-wise, they had a lot of guys, and he was like a freshman point guard kind of leading everyone around already, which was a lot of the appeal for him coming out of the draft because I remember I like wrote a draft profile of Tyus Jones on Bright Side of the Sun like 10, 11 years As ago. you should. And now these guys are like vets. We're old now is the <laughs> point I'm getting to. Yeah, style of play. And I, I really think that's it. Because I think, again, like, I don't think Book, Brad, or Kevin care about touches. They're going to just say whatever's good for the offense. And what I talked about with Kevin in Vegas, it's the same thing. Like, just he wants to run good offense. Yeah. Good offense. If the offense isn't pr producing while he's in the corner, that seems kind of stupid. Yeah, that's not what he said. I'm taking the words out of it. Like, I'm, that's what I'll say it for him. Yeah. It's stupid. <laughs> yeah. It's dumb. It's really not good. Uh, crazy uh, they'll yeah. look to avoid that and, that, and that's going to be the biggest challenge for Budenholzer through all of this is not only keeping all three guys engaged but keeping them incorporated enough mm -hmm. he's done it before but not to this level like I don't think this big three because Drew Holiday doesn't care at no all. like if anyone doesn't care Drew Holiday doesn't care and Chris Middleton very low assuming guy and honest. that's how Drew Holiday is good is like oh when you, where is someone going to help in this oh, I'm going to go rebound I'm going to go rip someone in the late in games and, and that's how I'm going to be clutch it's very different than how Book, Beal, KD are clutch off. Yeah, they're asking Bradley Beal to be Drew Holiday, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Not, not, <laughs> not doubting, that is not a doubt of Brad. It's just a, that's a lot to ask out of the guy. Real quick. Yeah. I don't think people say this enough, but it was his most efficient season. Like Brad was good last yeah. year. He was a good basketball player last year, and he had really good stretches. Yeah. He just kept getting hurt. That's It's yeah. very simple. Like He just kept getting hurt. The rhythm kept throw out, I'll out. throw out the last game. Like there, were, he wasn't the reason that team got swept. It's like it's just everyone's last memory, and I get yeah. it. It was his worst, probably the worst game of his life. I would guess. Probably, like, if I could ask him one point, I'm sure he would say yes. Like that's the worst I've ever played. Um, but he was he was good outside of that, and like that version of Brad, but over 65 games where he can build a rhythm is exactly what this team is like looking for and needs, and I'm sure thinks that they can get out of him. Mm -hmm. But it's like, can he just stay healthy enough so the rotations stay in a similar spot and everyone can build cohesion and continuity? Blah blah blah. Conversations we've had 47 times, we're gonna have 47 more times. More conversations are being had now on the airwaves. <laughs> nice segue. It's like hey, you now, do this professionally. This is the first time we've podcasted since I got a new radio show with Mitch Vereldis. It's called Arizona Sports at Night. The thing I recommend, and this is not to like make you, I hope you guys understand, and I hope the people like who are following me now already understand, Like, if you don't care about the show, just mute the account. Like When I retweet it, just mute the account. You'll never see it. That's <laughs> fine. Like You don't have to worry about it. You'll just get the sun stuff and like the survivor tweets at 3 a.m. or whatever that you usually get on my account. It's fine. I don't take anything personal. That's okay. If you don't only care about sun's ball and that's it, it's okay. No worries, but I have this show, and if you go follow the account, if you're interested in listening to the show, the best way to keep up with the show is by following our account. And it's because we are intermittently on. We're in and out of there. Select weeknights. And what that means is whenever a Suns game is going to be on, we're not going to be on the air, basically, because we are either going to be on from 6 to 8 or 7 to 8. But we're always going to 
uh, come before the Dimebacks. Like the Dimebacks play tonight, 640. We don't have a show. Uh, Monday, Dimebacks don't play. Guess what? We have a show. That's how it works. It's going to be a fun show. Sounds kind of, yeah, it's going to be a fun day. Uh, or kind, maybe not. Kind of confusing. Yeah, we'll see how the baseball goes. So it kind of comes and goes. So every week I go on the account, I tweet out what our schedule is. So if you're just like have that random thought in your head, like, oh, are they on tonight? You can just take the three taps, go to our account, pin tweet is there. That's our schedule. Boom, done. If you went the live listening type or you got busier things, you got a wife and kids and all of that or a husband and kids, whatever, um, for that time of day and you just want to listen to us later, Mitch and I specifically try and have conversations at last because mm-hmm. I think sports talk radio, it's very in the moment and very now, now, now. Whereas like if you listen to this pod, this pod does age a bit after media day. Like it just does. But we're going to pod after media day. You still can listen to it on Saturday. You can still listen to it on Sunday. If you listen to... Burns and Gambo today that I'm filling in on on Sunday, we're talking about like the Padres series coming in. Two baseball games have already happened, maybe even three. Maybe the D-back season is already over by then. Like you can't even really listen to it. We have conversations intentionally that are going to hold up as much as we can. Like the D-backs thing is one of those things. But I say that as a way of I hope like if you've subscribed to a sports radio talk show before and listened to it and been like, oh, this is old or whatever. And I'm listening to it two days later. We try to make that happen a little bit more so i hope everyone will check it out i think we've been having a lot of fun so far and i'm really excited for like the next month or two kellen on cardinals kellen on d-backs and also by the way i think you framed it this way when you were telling me about the show like i just want people to listen and be able to have smarter conversations which like if what happened with zach lowe getting laid off that doesn't make any sense at all but ESPN hires good NFL people like Mina Kimes and, and people like that to make you smarter about consuming a sport. So I would say that's kind of where your your guys's niches. Yeah, I think a lot of what people want to hear, maybe a lot of people want to hear like the yelly, talky, talk, talk, big talking head people talking stuff hmm. and saying incoherent stuff that doesn't make sense that you can roast online instead. Mm-hmm. But what we're going to be doing is the goal is three things that you've learned from the show that you didn't hear anywhere else before. And I'm like, I'm confident we've had that in every episode so far. I haven't even thought about it, but I'm just like, sure. Hey. We've said stuff that you've learned and can be stuff. Like, did you know that the Padres are top five in every category that exists in the second half of the season? Did you know that they're doing that despite not peak individual performance? Like no one has a 1.0 OPS. No one has like a sub two ERA. Their bullpen, their relievers, no one even has an ERA below <laughs> three, but yet they're top five in bullpen ERA. It doesn't really make sense to me. You just learned two Baseball. or three things right Baseball. there. Easy, yeah. easy stuff. So I, I hope you guys check it out again. If you don't, no hard feelings and that's fine. And again, I'm going to say it one more time on the podcast. I might tweet it once or twice. If you don't care, that's fine. And I bombard you with these retweets. Just mute the account. You won't see it. Won't be in your life. It's okay. Because I, sons, people, you guys are the primary reason why I was able to have this opportunity. Let's be honest. Like everyone following my son's stuff is the reason why I got these opportunities and other opportunities I've gotten. So I owe you guys a lot. All right. We got to beat it in, in the great words of Bradley. See you, man.